what are the odds? What are the ad? What are the ad? What are the ads? What are the ads? What are the ads? What are the odds? Who knew it could be done? Friends, neighbors, we're live. This is great. All right. Let me quickly uh, do the thumbnail thing before I forget to do that thing. And then we'll really be live for real. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Of course, hit the like button. That really helps out the videos. The channel lets others know, hey, there's a thing happening. Those of you who are learning English, we've got a lot of cool stuff planned for today. Well, not a lot of cool stuff. One cool thing planned today. <laughs> Only one, no more. But we will be doing the Q&A as we usually do. We will be doing, we will be doing the Q&A. So get your English questions ready because we're, I, will, I will be answering your questions. Don't forget to hit the like button and also to subscribe so that you can see future videos. And also, do I have anything else? No. <coughs> Excuse me. Goodness gracious. If you want me to recover from my seasonal allergies, please subscribe and hit the like button. It's very important. It's urgent. It's, a, it's, an, emer it's an emergency. And also check out my full courses, of course, in the links in the description. Very important. Okay, I have to update the thumbnail. So just give me one second. I'm going to blow my nose. Uh, so I know that's gross, but... Um, what are you going to do? I've got seasonal allergies. Because my body is betraying me. Allergies really are. That's what allergies are. It's a betrayal. There's a harmless thing like pollen, like ragweed, that is not harmful for the body. You can rub it in your face if you weren't allergic to it, and it would be no problem. But then when you have an allergy, your body goes, no, this is a terrible problem. Ah, ah, runny nose, sneezing all day, 7,000 sneezes, anaphylactic shock, a little bit of that, why not? Uh, high blood pressure or something. I think that's one of the long-term effects. Uh, uh, runny, runny, I said runny nose, red eyes, scratchy skin, rashes, all of it, all of it. But why, why allergies? I don't like that pollen. I don't like that that cat fur is really uh I don't like it. Allergies. That's what it, that's what allergies are. That's all they are. Nothing more than that. And for that reason, they are a betrayal. Sorry for the rant about allergies. But it's true. They're a scourge and a calamity. A catastrophe. An unfathomable calamity. All right, enough, enough adjectives for today. No more adjectives. I won't be saying any more adjectives today. Isn't that great? Oh, dang it. I said, I said an adjective. All right, we're good. Okay, oh, let me share this into the WhatsApp group. I like to mention the WhatsApp group and then not tell anyone how to get into it. That's what I like to do. <laughs> because then if you want to get in, you got to work really hard. you got to find someone in the group, figure out how to get them to invite you in, and then you can join. It's a sort of a secret club, an elite thing. Makes it more precious. But if you give me a million dollars, I'll let you in. All right. Let me check, see what we've got here, see who we've got. Mary McCain, greetings from Mary. Aleda is here. Hip, hip, hooray. Mark and Markendel says, I don't have access in that WhatsApp group. Oh, no, Markel. You can either find someone who is in the group and figure out how to convince them to invite you, which they may or may not do, not up to me, or you can give me a million dollars. Those are your those are your two choices. 
Aleda figured it out. No, Aleda, Aleda gave me a million, a million dollars, and so I let her in. All right, guys, you get your questions ready and stuff, all that. If you have questions I maybe I didn't answer last time, then I'll, we'll try to get to those. Uh, and uh, a million thanks. No, 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 I can't. I can't take thank yous to the bank. Uh, Mark Ken Mar Kendall. I can't buy a Lamborghini with thank yous. Hello, hello. Yeah, Aleda, who invited you into the group? Who's who's the uh, who's the gatekeeper? Who's the gatekeeper? Who's the one to say, okay, you can come in? Because think about it: if there's a group and it's not open, when we started the group, it was totally open. Now it's not. Um, when you invite someone in to the group, you are kind of responsible responsible for them not like you need to say okay no, don't don't say that that that's don't say that sort of thing not like that it's more like if that person becomes a problem big problem in the group and you brought them in then it's kind of on you in a way and that you lose some of your social credit that way and that's a kind of mechanism that i like i think that's good it's a system of vouching for someone. I know you're cool, so I'll invite you and I'll let you in. Uh, and that that keeps the group, I think, very cool. I, the vibe in the group is really good. It's what I it's what I kind of always hoped it would be. Um, because because I've started groups in the past where I was in charge of everything and the admin and okay, now we're going to do this today. And it never works out because you can't force culture. You can't force things to work in a group setting. And so for the group that we have now, it's more like uh, organic. People come in through invites from people they know. And then a lot people are very active in the group, quite active. The group is very active, independent from me, right? So I pop in there sometimes, sometimes I don't pop in or just watch and um it where it's working i think it's working well i'm quite happy happy about it what's pablo oh, pablo's fault yes blame that pablo guy <laughs> pablo's interesting because he's sort of a he's sort of a chaos figure so so sometimes he'll say things so you you, you go whoa <laughs> but at the same time you wouldn't want him to not say those things because he's so in, he's such an interesting person. Pablo is, is very cool and very interesting, and I wouldn't uh, wouldn't have him any other way. Douglas says I'm a I'm a good boy. Please invite me. <laughs> I don't I don't have any invites. I don't have them. <laughs> you're go, you're talking to the wrong person. Uh, yes, I personally let Mary McCain in because, well. I think you can learn. I think you can learn things about people based on how they interact in comments. DFC Garage, long time no see. You were, uh, you, you were. I w I met you, or we talked rather, when I was doing a different type of class, I believe. So welcome. Yes, Pablo is a gentleman. Although I would separate those that last word into two words. Uh. All right. Any questions, guys? No? If not, I'm going to let my allergies once more take control of me and uh, before stuff comes dripping out of my nose, I don't want that to happen. What's worse, seeing me blow my nose or seeing snot come out of my nose? You don't want that. Nobody wants that. But the weird thing is, it's a seasonal thing, it seems, but I usually get seasonal allergies in the autumn. I usually don't get seasonal allergies in the springtime, so I don't know what's going on. It's very strange. I don't, I don't get it. It's super weird. Okay. Hello, Mohammed is here. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Don't forget, of course, to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And 
check out my full courses in the links in the description. You can go to my website and check those out. They're on sale. And otherwise, I think we'll take a few questions. So get your questions ready. I see one from Mar Kendell. It's tough to say. You're interested in psychology, Mohammed. I'm interested in psychology too. Very interesting topic. I like to read about psychology. Mehdi, yes, I am from the USA. I am. So sorry about that. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I am. Oh, that's good. I'm glad I said your name correctly. Mark Kendall. Mark Kendall Philippe or Felipe. Philippe or Felipe. So, Mark Kendall says how to sound closer as native speaker. A better question would be maybe how can I sound closer to a native speaker or perhaps how can I sound like a native speaker that would be a good way to say it I'm Haitian Haitian okay very cool so it kind of depends on what you mean of course because someone could have very natural pronunciation and still really not sound like a native speaker someone could have really good use of the language, maybe their use of vocabulary and phrases, and then have a very strong accent. I know both people. I know people who are both. So for example, when I first met my wife, she wasn't my wife when I first met her, because <laughs> how would that work? When we first met, one thing I noticed about her is that she didn't have a very strong Chinese English accent. There's a very strong accent in the Northeast that is a kind of like this when people say things, it sounds like this. Very strong. She did not have that. So she had this natural sound for whatever reason. I guess that's just a sensitivity to different sounds and then an ability to connect that to the mouth muscles and then make sounds in English that sound more like how native English speakers speak, not necessarily American English speakers. It could be British or, or Australian or whatever. So maybe that's a natural ability. Some people have that natural ability where they can hear a way of speaking, an accent, and then kind of pick it up. Maybe it's not perfect, but get close to that kind of naturally. And for those who can do that naturally, that's a huge advantage. Now, if you don't have that natural, natural ability, that doesn't mean you can't learn it. It's just more of an uphill battle for you. But when I first met my wife, she didn't have strong English overall, strong use of vocabulary. She spoke almost no English. Very few phrases. We we're all use, always using translators or broken Chinese or broken English. It was, it was a fun challenge. That was great. But... Um, so that's an example of very natural sound to the ear, but not good use of the language. And then the only way to get there is to try to develop that awareness of the ear that connects to the mouth and use shadowing, for example, to get closer to the pronunciation. That would be the way you work on that. The other way then is another person that I know, I'm not gonna name them, it's a lady, and this person has a very strong command of the English language. Many words and phrases, professional English, any type of English, written English, very strong fundamentals, very strong use of a lot of phrases. If you read her writing, it's, it looks great. But she has an extremely strong Chinese English accent. So everything she says is correct. And if you read a transcript of it, you would say, wow. But when you hear it, it's like a this. <laughs> it's really strong. And I say to myself, whoa, 
there's a big disconnect between sound and command of the language. So that's another way. And that's why accent can be important. Because when someone hears what they would describe as a very strong accent, often they can't see through that to the real skill underneath. And they might find it a little distracting. You know English great, but if people don't quite understand the accent part, the pronunciation, they might struggle with comprehension, especially in meetings, online, things like that, right? So, work on both, definitely. If you have uh, that natural sort of accent, but you feel like you don't have the, the, the fundamentals, well, then you have a long journey ahead. <laughs> you've got to learn those. You've got to read. You've got to practice speaking as much as you can. You have to absorb yourself in the language, immerse yourself in the culture as much as possible. But if you have the other part and you find people are not always understanding what you say because of your accent, then you have to develop that sensitivity and that awareness, which takes time, but I would argue may take less time if you do it the right way. Because if you develop that awareness to the sounds and an ability to make those sounds, you're going to you're going to get it pretty quickly. But it really is all about building that awareness of the sounds. What is it that makes the rrr sound compared to what I'm saying? Maybe uh. What is the difference between those? And what do I have to do with my mouth to make it make that sound that I'm hearing? That's it. It's as simple as that. So I hope that answers your question, Merkendel. If you haven't already, guys, don't forget to hit... Why did I put this in the middle? <laughs> don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. All right. I'm a lifesaver. I wouldn't go that far. You're welcome. No problem. I'm from Iraq in South Iraq. I want to speak English, same as you. Oh. Can you please give me a tip in English grammar? You know, when you're supposed to, when you ask a question, you're supposed to be a little more specific. If I walked up to you and said, teach me your language, <laughs> what, what would you say? You would say, where do I start? So teach me some grammar, huh? Well, I'd have to think about that. Let me see what I've got here. I might have something interesting for you. My question is, I understand English 70%, but when I try to speak, uh, it turned to 40%. And also, I live in a country where English is not spoken. What can I do? I think I talked about this in the last live lesson, but you've got to immerse your, yourself in the language and pretend you're living in an English-speaking country constantly surround yourself with the language all the time constantly podcasts videos write read practice speaking attend meetups all of those things you've got to immerse yourself in it and if you don't do that it's going to be tough you don't have to live in, an e in a native english speaking country to improve your english for sure mm. Let me see. The question is very general. So I need to do a little digging here. I might come up with nothing. Kind of an unfair question, to be honest. Okay. Why don't we do this? Why don't we talk about 
uh, an, and the. Because that's so simple, but people get that one mixed up so much. It's very simple, very easy. And yet, it's often not, not done correctly. So Arun says, can you please give me a tip in English grammar? And since you haven't asked me anything specifically, I'm going to just pick something by myself. What I'm going to pick are an and the. Okay, now these are called articles, but let's not let's not worry too much about names. I don't want to cause any confusion. Let's just say we're going to learn an, a, uh, and the, and how we use these and why people get these mixed up all the time. Now you know that a uh, and an means one, right? Okay. And you know that the can mean one too. And you probably know that when you say the, you're talking about something that we both understand. But if I say a, uh, are we talking about something that we both understand? Well, yes, but in a different way. So let's just talk about what these are exactly, kind of explain them, and then we'll talk about how people mix these up. So, if I say, there's something over there, I say, can you please hand me a screwdriver? I'm trying to fix something. Can you please hand me a screwdriver? Now, what do I mean by that? I want one screwdriver for whatever I'm working on. But, so you, you go over to the counter and you grab, you grab one. The first one that you see, you just grab it and you bring it over to me. But it's not the right one. It's the wrong end. So I say, ah, not, not that one. Well, whose fault is that misunderstanding? I got the wrong tool. Is it my fault for not communicating correctly, or is it yours for grabbing the wrong thing? What do you think? It's actually my fault as a communicator. Why? If there are four screwdrivers over there, and I say, bring me a screwdriver, I want one of those four. But saying a uh, suggests that any one of those is okay. So when you bring it over to me and I say, oh, wrong one, you think, what? You said a screwdriver. You didn't say which one. So it's my fault. Right? Yeah. Now, if I really don't care, maybe I don't care what the end of the screwdriver is because I just need to use it as a poking tool, right? I'm just kind of stabbing something. <laughs> I don't know what I'm poking at with a screwdriver, but I, I just need it for, for poking purposes. <laughs> okay, so I say, give me a screwdriver. You bring one of them over to me, and any one you bring over to me is fine, right? Okay, so that works. Now, what would I have to do if I wanted a specific one? Well, I would probably have to say the but we have to be careful with that too. So let's say again, there are four screwdrivers over there. I say, please bring me the screwdriver. Is that okay? No. Why not? Because there are four and the is about one thing usually. It doesn't have to be. You could say the screwdrivers, but if I want one thing, it could be about one thing, right? But is something that we both understand. But if there are four things, how could we both have the understanding of that thing? How could we both know what I'm talking about? Right. So what do I do? Well, I would have to add something to it to make it more clear. So when you use the, you're being more specific. You're talking about a specific thing or a specific group of things. However, if it's unclear which one of those you're talking about because there are several then you need to add description. You could put that as an adjective. You could do it as an adjective in front of the noun. You could say, could you please bring me the flathead screwdriver? Now, if there's only one flathead screwdriver and the other three are something else, like Phillips, flathead is this one, Phillips is this one, then we're good because there's only one. Can you please bring me the flathead screwdriver? Oh, yeah, sure, you grab it, you give it to me, thank you. That's the one I want. Now, if I said, bring me a flathead screwdriver, 
and there are two flathead and two Phillips, then you could bring me either one of the flathead. See how that works? But if there's no, there are no screwdrivers over there at all, and I say bring me a screwdriver, then that could be that could be anything. <laughs> that could you could go to the supermarket and buy one and bring it to me. But if I say give me the screwdriver and there are no screwdrivers, then you'll say I'm confused. What do you mean? There aren't any screwdrivers. What do you mean, the screwdriver? But if you have one in your hand, and I say, give me the screwdriver, then I know you mean, you know I mean the one in your hand, and you know I know you mean, you know, I know you, I know you know which one I'm talking about, and you know I know which one I'm talking about. There we go. I got it. <laughs> right? So it's more specific. Now, if there's only one screwdriver on the counter, no problem. Then what do we say? We say the. There's only one. So we don't have to worry about this. Give me the screwdriver. All right. Oh, there it is. Got it. Okay. Now, if we want to be a little more specific with thes, then we just say a detail after it. Give me the screwdriver on the counter, because that's location. So sometimes we use an adjective in front. Give me the flathead screwdriver. And sometimes, if it's specific about where it is, its position, then we say it after. Give me the screwdriver on the counter. Give me the screwdriver next to the TV. Give me the screwdriver on the floor. So it's actually pretty cool how you can add things to, to the, especially. And you can add things to a as well. But adding things to the allows you to still be specific and still talk about one specific thing or one group of things, depending on where and how you add the details, whether it's adjectives or something after it. And we could say, for example, tomorrow we're going to the park. Now you might say, okay, which park? Which park? Why aren't, why aren't you saying a park? Because I don't know what park you're talking about. I mean, you're going to the park. Or I'm going to the gym later. What do you mean the gym? There are many gyms in the city. I don't know which one you're talking about. Which gym? Why don't you say a gym? Well, this is kind of this is an interesting special case because I may either know which gym you're talking about because I know you. I may know which park you're talking about because I know you. And so because I know you, when you say the, I know what you mean. So we're good, right? Or the other way would be, I don't care. You know which gym you're going to go to because you probably don't go to different gyms, you know which park you're going to go to because you probably don't go to, you probably know which park you intend to go to at least. That's the one you typically go to or the one at least in your head. It's specific because it's in your imagination about the future. So when you say I'm going to go to the park, which one I'm talking about is in here. I have a picture of it in my mind and I don't need to know specifically. Now, I might say, oh, yeah, which one? And then you'll tell me, but that's fine. As long as it's known which thing we're talking about, we can use the. And for those cases, it would be very strange to say, tomorrow I'm going to a park. Or later I'm going to a gym. A gym. Well, it is a gym, but I want to be more specific. So that's how these work. I think they're quite interesting. They're so simple in some ways, but in others, once you start to explore them, it gets more complicated. And I think that's why people get a little bit mixed up. So if you have any other questions about this or anything else, let me know. Don't forget to subscribe, of course. Very important. Sub 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 subscribe to the channel so that you can see future videos. And also hit the like button to support the channel. That helps out a lot. And check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. It's a good question. I mean, well, no, that's, it's not a good question, actually. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's a good question I asked myself. Uh, I'm originally from Syria, but I live in Turkey now. Very cool. Amine is here. Hello, Luke. You are the best teacher in the world. Many thanks for your help. Oh, much appreciated, Amine. That's very nice of you. So kind. I imagine you're British or American. Mary is Persian. K 
Pau Silver says, could you please explain the meaning of the account for in this sentence? I can allow you freedom, but cannot account for it. I think I can talk about that one, yeah. What you're talking about, I think I know it is because of the part you say there is Philip and the other. F Philip's head is what it's called. It's called a Philip's head. You guys don't know what I'm talking about? I'll show you a picture. Let me set, let me show you a picture quickly. Let me show you. There we go. Ooh, nice one. There. See? Do you see the do you see the tip of this one? That is called a Phillips head. A Phillips head, and the other one is called a flat head. Phillips head. That's what I'm talking about. D Douglas is from Brazil. Very cool. Whose name is Axis Mundi? Axis Mundi stands for the world tree or the tree at the axis of heaven and earth. Very interesting stuff. Okay. Arun is already subscribed. Thanks, Arun. Much appreciated. Star screwdriver. Well, I guess that makes sense. The only the only issue I would have with calling it a star screwdriver is that, and this is just a small point, but in my mind, a star has five points and a Phillips head has four points. So I realize that that's kind of a, a, <laughs> not important, but take a look. You got one, two, three, four. So I suppose you could call it a star head, but uh, we call it a Phillips head. I don't know why it's called a Phillips head, actually. Why is it called that? Let me search that. Why, why is it called Phillips head? I'm searching that. How did Google know that that's what I wanted to know? <sighs> it's a common misconception that the Phillips screwdriver is named after it, its inventor. But the truth is that the screwdriver is really named after Henry F. Phillips, the owner of the company which purchased the design from uh, its inventor, John P. Thompson. So, Mr. Thompson invented the screwdriver, and Mr. Phillips bought it. <laughs> That's why. It's that age-old tale. Everything has a price. What? Money buys happiness and screwdrivers. Um, I think there's a saying that goes like that. Money buys happiness and screwdrivers. Oh, no, no, maybe it's money can't buy happiness, but it can buy screwdrivers. Maybe. Yeah, that's what it is. Money can't buy happiness, but it can buy screwdrivers. Yeah, that's the quote. That's the quote. Usually people just quote the first part. They usually just say money can't buy happiness, but they're leaving out the, the, the rest of it, which has always been there. It's always been in the in the quote but it can buy screwdrivers. There's another kind of screwdriver with five points called torque head, if memory serves. Wow, that's cool. We're getting deep on the screwdriver topic. Interesting stuff. I'm learning more and more about screwdrivers every minute. All right. Uh, I'm going to answer this question from uh, about account for.
Cow Silver, Co or Cow Silver, says, could you please explain the meaning of account for in this sentence? I can allow you freedom, but I cannot account for it. I would like to have more context to really explain what this is about, but let's talk about to account for something in general, okay? Now, to account for something is kind of related to accounting. Accounting is what? Well, this is keeping track of where things are, like money. Numbers, we know what is spent on what, the money coming in, the money going out. So when we see all of this add up and what we thought we spent is what is actually spent and what we thought we made is what is actually made, we say, okay, everything's accounted for. Okay, so we can understand that as a general, what I expect to find when I look further into this is what I find. But if I find that something is there and I don't know why, then we say it's unaccounted for. And that could be stretched to mean I didn't consider that. So let me try to explain a couple of examples. Okay, If someone says we're going to go on a hiking trip okay we're going to go on a hiking trip and maybe it's a one day one day trip okay but we didn't realize we didn't remember that the higher you go up a mountain if it's in the mountains the colder it gets and the more likely it is that there could be snow above the snow line there's sometimes snow in the winter in the summer, rather, not the winter. Of course, there's snow in the winter. In the summer, right? Okay. So in that case, we saw in the weather report, oh, it's going to be a sunny, warm day. Great. Let's go hiking. We get some friends together. We drive out to the hiking trail. It's a beautiful day. It's sunny. We're walking along. And the incline starts to go up, 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 up. Then we start to feel cold. Very cold. Very, very cold. 30 minutes later, we're freezing. I thought it was supposed to be a nice day. It is a nice day down there <laughs> because we're hiking so high up that, that it's getting colder. Maybe we're above the tree line. Is it the tree line or the snow line? might be the tree line. The tree line is so high that trees don't grow above it. It's really cold. and There might be snow up there. So then someone says, getting back to the point, oh, Yes, I checked the weather, but I guess I didn't account for the altitude. I didn't account for the difference in temperature. If you're going up a mountain, there's going to be a difference in temperature. Well, not every mountain, but if it's a fairly tall mountain, there's going to be a difference in temperature. I didn't account for that. That means in my calculations of preparing for this, I didn't that didn't enter my equation. That didn't enter my preparations for this hiking trip. I didn't account for it. I didn't consider it. So there it's basically like, didn't think of that, didn't consider it. But the other way we use this is closer to the accounting sense. Something is there, but we don't know why it's there. We don't know where it came from, from perhaps. We don't know its origin. We don't know what it's supposed to be there for. Okay, so what would be an example of that in daily life? Well, let's say that there's a large gathering, a big event, okay? And let's, since we're on the theme of cold weather, let's just use this, okay? There's, at this event, it's an indoor thing, right? A row of hooks. And people come in and they put their coat on the hook and then they go in it's this event, playing Twister, or I don't know what they're doing in there. It's, it's an event. Don't ask me for the details. This is a fictional thing. I'm talking about the coats. Now, it's over. It ends. Three hours later, time to go home. There's still a coat on the hook, one coat. Everybody has left. So this coat is unaccounted for. I don't know why it's here. It wasn't here before the event, but it's here now after the event, but everyone is gone. So there's a mismatch between the reality and what I would expect, which would be that one coat equals one person. That all the coats 
would match all the people because there were no coats before. And of course, I understand that it's probably because someone forgot their coat. But when I post a notice into the group chat where everyone is later, hey, there's one coat on the coat rack that's still unaccounted for. Does anybody know whose it is? I can use that phrase as a way to suggest that I don't understand why it's here and I, I'm trying to find its owner. Okay. Actually, I, I understand why, why it's here because someone forgot it. But I'm just trying to give a simple example that communicates the idea. So account for something, it's used in those, usually used in those two ways. Now, going back to, going back to this example, Explain the meaning of account for in this sentence. I can allow you freedom, but I cannot account for it. I need more to fully understand it, but it's something like I can allow you freedom, but I can't explain. I can't explain it. I cannot explain to you why you have it. That needs context to really understand what that means. I can't just say, oh, let me tell you everything about this. I need more context. This is one thing where people send me a single sentence and they'll say, hey, tell me what this means. I don't know this phrase. This phrase could mean 10 different things. How can I know? <laughs> like, because I'm an English teacher, I must immediately know everything. I get one phrase and it's, what is this? Things are contextual. What is around it? What are the sentences around it? What's happening in this story? I need more before I can say for sure. I think it means can't explain it can't tell you why it is this way, but that could be totally wrong simply because I don't have the full context. So if you guys want me to really give a full answer for this sort of example sentence, make sure to include some context. But I hope you have a better understanding of the two common ways that we use account for, both very common. And actually there are some other uses as well which are, which are less common, but uh, those are the ones that are really common. Guys, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. That really helps out the channel. Much appreciated. Also, don't forget to check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. Good question, though. Thank you. Thank you very much. Context, people. Context. Yeah, context. That matters. A for Anna is here. Aloha. Luke, I have to say I'm pretty grateful that you started this live at this time because it's when I'm home doing nothing. Well, I'm, I, I don't usually do it during this time. Absolutely. So sometimes I like to switch it around. I Mark my words, friends and neighbors. At some time later this year or early next year, I will have a schedule. It's going to be on the banner of the channel. I'm going to post it all the time. It's going to be very stable. It's going to be very reg regular. Everyone will know exactly when I'm doing uh, live streams. So don't worry. That's a promise, but I am not promising when. I get many, 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 many complaints about having an irregular schedule for live streams, and I fully admit that it is irregular, and uh, I apologize. All right. Uh, yes, it'll happen. It's going to happen. Don't worry. Someday, soon, maybe, hopefully. Who knows? What's the difference between though and although? Yeah, so actually, I did cover this in a full video, especially using though. Um, I would say check out that full video. I spent quite a bit of time working on the examples for that one. Um, so yeah, that would be worth checking out for sure. Uh, generally speaking, well, in some cases they're used in the same way, right? Um, for example, someone might start a sentence, though I've never seen the movie, I've heard it's good. Although I've never seen the movie, I've heard it's good. So in that case, they're kind of the same. But if you put that in the end, then you say, I've never seen the movie, although I've heard it's good. 
that would work. But I've never seen the movie, though I've heard it's good. It's also okay, but then not nearly as common. So there are a lot of nuances there. And I would encourage you to first check out that, that video about specifically about though, then <coughs> check back. Because, uh, yeah, spent quite a bit of time working on that one. You're drinking coffee, Leandro. Very good. Cool. Yes, I'm drinking coffee as well. This is my second cup of coffee for the day. Okay. She got a copy of Vogue. I can't get this sentence. Does that mean... <clears throat> she got a copy of Vogue. I can't get this sentence. Is that common English conversation? Oh, what does this mean? Sure. <clears throat> I can answer that. The only question is, who do we want on the front? <clears throat> Mary McCain asks, Cloud English, I guess that's me. She got a copy of Vogue. I can't get this sentence. Does that, is that common in English conversation. Yes. Let's first explain to get a copy of something. If there's usually a physical thing that there are many of, especially written materials, we typically use the word copy. That is the counting word that we use to talk about them. A copy of, and then say the title of a book, of a magazine, of a newspaper. And that's all it is. So if you say, I'm going to stop by the convenience store, the deli, and grab a copy of The Times. Well, then, you know I mean The New York Times, but I shorten it to The Times. Now, I've never done that. I don't think I've ever purchased a newspaper in my life. I am a child of the internet. Why would I do that? But if I did that kind of thing, that's what I would say. I'm going to stop by the deli and grab a copy of the Times. A copy of the Times because there are many. It's not just in that that deli. It's They're everywhere. But it's today's one. A copy of the Times. I could also have a copy of a book. Hey, have you ever read... What have I got back there? I don't know. Those are all fake books. Yeah, I've got a copy right there. That book on top, that's what that book is. I've got a copy of that 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 book. It's right there. There it is. There is the copy, that physical thing. There are many of them in the world, and that's one of them, the printed thing. Now, you will sometimes hear it used for other things, but typically it is for written materials. Back when it was common to buy DVDs for movies, then some people would still say a copy of that movie on DVD. I'm getting a copy of that game. Some people will still use that because people do buy game discs still. Yeah, I guess that's pretty popular. So yeah, you'll hear people using copy for other things besides written materials, but it's probably most common for that. Now, we would less often use that for things like movies now because when we watch a movie, we usually just do that on the internet. And when you watch it on the internet, you probably wouldn't say, yes, I've got a copy of that on my computer. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, I've got that movie on my computer. We say that the movie is on my computer. The game is on my computer rather than a copy of that. Although you could say it, it would be a little unusual. Now, what the heck is Vogue? Well, the thing that maybe could hint to you what that is, it would be if that were a capital V. It should be a capital V because it's the name of a magazine. It's a fashion magazine. The problem is it's not a capital V. 
So if in the original it's capital V, whenever you see a capital letter, you say, ah, name, some kind of name, specific magazine, specific person, specific place, whatever. Vogue is a, Vogue is a fashion magazine uh, like this. This is the cover of Vogue. Ooh, she's on the cover of Vogue. Very nice. It's a fashion magazine. And that, although it doesn't look like Taylor Swift, apparently it is. Uh, that doesn't look anything like Taylor Swift. Am I crazy? That does, that, I can't believe that's Taylor Swift. Whatever. Anyway, this is a copy of, well, this is the cover, but if I had one in my hand, I would say, ah, I got a copy of Vogue. I got the copy with Taylor Swift on it. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine me doing that? That's unlikely. But yes, pay attention to, uh, capitalized letters. All right. Well, hopefully that answers your question, Mary McCain. Do you have a copy of Vogue? I don't think I've ever purchased a copy of Vogue, but there's nothing wrong with doing so. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to, of course, subscribe and check out my full courses in the links in the description. By the way, those are on sale. Woohoo. Those are on sale. So check those out on my website. Okay. Um, how to pronounce correctly when we read books? Do we have to check the IPA for each word? Do you have any tips? Well, I did also do a video about how to check pronunciation. I did a full nonsense poem and at the same time taught how to check pronunciation. I would recommend using a website called The Free Dictionary. You search the word, you click on the little sound icon, and you listen to it. Don't use the APA, in my opinion, because you're going to just see it. But that doesn't tell you how to say it. Even if you learn the correlation between the phonetic symbols and the spelling, or the phonetic symbols and the actual pronunciation. What did you really learn? Do you really know how to say it? Is that really helping you with your pronunciation? I think no. So what you should do instead is develop your ear because that's what native English speakers do. That's what you do in your language. So why shouldn't you do it the same way when you learn English? Develop your ear, work on your listening, build your awareness, and then... Um, you'll make progress. Speaking of Margot Robbie, I think she's on, because I did a Google search, I just searched Vogue, and Margot Robbie's, Margot Robbie's the one right beside Taylor Swift. That's odd. Someone mentioned Margot Robbie, and in my Google search, the Margot Robbie one was the one, was the one right beside it. That's Margot Robbie. Let's see if Margot Robbie and Taylor Swift really look the same, side by side. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of. Not, not, not too different, similar. Never thought I'd be looking at covers of Vogue in my life, but here we are. It's happening. It's happening. Now I'm just looking at covers of Vogue. Usually I've got ladies on it, but there was a big controversy when Harry Styles was on the cover because um, yeah, typically, I think always, it's women. First male on Vogue. I don't know why I suddenly care about this. Yeah, it's the Harry Styles one. So it's always been women on the cover of Vogue. And then, I think it was last year at some time, there was a big controversy about this one, Harry Styles, who's a singer, wearing a dress on the cover of Vogue. And uh, some people were very upset. I think uh, groups of feminists maybe I don't know which people were upset but some people were very upset about it uh, for some reason 
I'm not exactly sure why, but apparently he makes his own rules, which I find incredible. Anyone can make their own rules. That's just amazing. He makes his own rules. Harry Styles. Was he really the first? I think he was the first person on Vogue by himself. Anyway, who cares? Who cares? Well, I want to talk about something else, if that's okay with you. And then we'll get back to the questions. Okay. So, um, well, let me make sure that this is working properly. Oh, let me move that around a little bit. Okay, there we go. Yeah, we're good. One of the questions I get a lot is, where can I find a native speaking teacher, a private teacher? And I don't have very strong recommendations, but there are services out there, so we should, we should know about them and you should check them out for yourself. Now we've talked about in the past one, we've looked at one, italki. Some people seem to like it, some people don't like it as much, I don't have a very strong opinion about it, but it is a place to find teachers. Now there's another one, and it's called Preply, and I want to take a look. This is not a review of the quality of the teachers necessarily, because, well, it's a platform to find teachers. So I don't want to make any statements about the teachers on the platform, because the whole point of it is to find a teacher that you like, and teachers may be the right fit for you or not the right fit for you. So what we're going to do is just take a look at it and see if it would provide a way to find a teacher that you might like. So let's take a look at Preply. Let's take a look. Why not? Pop over here. Here we are. This is Preply. And you can see on the website that there are a bunch of teachers on the front page. You can you can learn different things. You can, you can learn different topics. I believe you can learn uh, science and uh, things like that. But I've I've searched already. I've searched already English language. Okay, so you would search English language. You can make an account. It's very easy to do that. You can just link your Google account. That's what I did. And then you can find uh, breakdowns. I want to find English for work. I could click on that and then it would load teachers. I want English for life abroad. I want English for kids. I want speaking practice in general. And then you can browse. Now, the cool thing I like about it is that it has very good filters. And when you put in the filters, it just changes this list. And you don't have to load a whole page over again. So actually, I think from the user experience point of view, it's quite good. I can choose the time available. I can search the per hour. So it's up to $40. That means all the teachers charge less than $40 per hour. Personally, I think that's very reasonable. I know quite a few teachers who charge much more than that. So $40 is quite reasonable. And you can see that this teacher charges 17, 12. You can browse by price. So let's see what happens if I slide this down to see what happens if I slide this down to six dollars. Hey, there we go. <laughs> cool. I got a teacher from Brazil here teaching English, a teacher from Tunisia teaching English, and from the Philippines teaching English for, for under six dollars an hour. Uh, so let me go back up here. I'm just going to search the whole range to forty dollars. And I want a teacher from either the UK or United States or Canada. And I don't care what they also speak, but if you wanted them to also speak some Spanish in the class, then you could search something like also speaks Chinese. And then that's going to bring up, for example, Tracy here. And I, I don't know Tracy, but she also speaks Chinese. And I guess she also speaks French and Korean. Wow, this is 
Mandarin, Chi Mandarin, Chinese, Korean, and French, and English. Amazing. A real polyglot. Tracy, cool lady. She only has one review? Wow. She must be new. She's got to be new, right? So let me take this off as well. I don't want to I don't want to bias my search results too much, but I think this is quite interesting. I like the user experience so far, and I think the key for a platform like this and with one like iTalki is discover there are a couple keys. Discoverability. You have to be able to find teachers because the teachers are not hired by Preply. Anybody can make an account, and if they get approved, they can become a teacher on Preply, but they're still their own teacher, and they can teach the Preply materials or not. They can kind of choose, and I don't know all the details, but I know that they have approved materials, and sometimes they allow other teachers to use their own materials. So they're a teacher on the platform, just like with italki. And so it's really just a discovery platform. It's a, it's a place to discover a teacher. How do you know if a teacher is a good fit for you? Well, the most important thing, I think, would be their personality and the type of person they are. How would you find that out? You would check out their profile, which we'll do in a second, and you would also watch their video. It's pretty well established that video is one of the most important factors when it comes to feeling whether or not a person is a good fit for you for your company. That's why a lot of companies now are doing video interviews where you record a video and send that instead of maybe sending a cover letter. Same here. I want to know how you talk. If I'm a learner, I want to know how you talk, your pronunciation. Do I want to learn from you? So the video is very important and that's why I think they put it right there, right up at the top, which I think is pretty cool. And you don't need to click in to see the preview. You can watch it immediately. You can scroll and see right away these teachers. Okay, so here's here's one, Stephen. And I can book a trial lesson. That should be free. Is that free? We'll check that out. And I can watch his preview without doing anything else. It's one click, and I think that's a really good thing. I'm kind of just talking about the UX here, but it seems like so far a pretty good place to discover because of the user experience. That's very important. So Stephen here... Stephen has 55 active students. He's taught 1,696 lessons. He speaks English natively, and he's very high level in Spanish. He specializes in technical business and scientific English to intermediate and advanced level students. Okay, he, he, his lessons are $19 per hour. In my opinion, very reasonable, really worth it. If you want to improve your English and get feedback, an experienced teacher, are they worth $19 an hour? 100%. That is not expensive. Even if you think that's expensive, that rate is, you get what you pay for, really. Okay, Tracy, she's got 15 active students. But Tracy, my question is, if you have 15 active students, why don't you ask them to give you reviews? Please give me a review. That's going to help you out, Tracy. My, just some personal advice there for you, Tracy. Get more reviews from your students. Stephen has five. That's not a lot. Why are there not more reviews here? One review, one review. This is crazy. All right, let's see what, let's see what uh, Tracy has to say about herself. Explain yourself, Tracy. You might only have one review. Click on this. Hi everyone, my name is Tracy and I am located in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is in the southern part of the U.S. Um, I am a current undergraduate senior at the University of Alabama, which also happens to be in Tuscaloosa, where I am majoring in management information systems, uh, minoring in Chinese and pursuing... Okay, we don't need to watch the whole thing. Good job, Tracy, I guess. Why not? Uh, let's see what Steven has to say. Check out Steven's. Stevens is a YouTube Hi, video. My name okay. is Stephen Greenleaf, and I love to teach. I primarily teach English to native speakers of Spanish. My teaching specialties are in technical English, mm. business English, and scientific English for intermediate and advanced level students. All right. Thank you very I'm much, Stephen. California. I like your stairs. And Those are great stairs. See that wood, that wood stairs? Cool railing. 
Okay, so it seems pretty discoverable, and then when you click into each person's profile, you get a drop down. Let's see if I click on their name, if I can get even more. Ah, yes, very good. I specialize in, okay, specialization. You can learn more about them. 10 lessons taught in the past seven days, okay. You can see their schedule. Click on the times in your local time. Reviews. Samatini says, I like his teaching style. He is one of the rare teachers who will detect students' weaknesses and facilitate, facilitate them to correct their mistakes. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. So this is Preply. Now, there are other options out there, but people are always asking me, where can I go? Well, this seems to be a pretty good place to find tutors. I realize that for some people, this might be a little bit expensive. Some of them are more, some of them are less, but I would urge you to think about the, the things that you do for yourself as investments. If you think you need a teacher, what do you want to get? If you say, okay, well, I can pay $4 for a teacher, but it doesn't look like they're very good, So I'm, but I'm getting $4 worth, are you though? It may be, in the long run, a much better investment to spend $19 an hour, $20 an hour, even though that might seem expensive, because you might get way, way more for that, because a really good teacher is far away from a teacher who's not very good. It's not like all teachers are the same. A good one-to-one -one teacher is a thousand miles from a poor one-to-one -one teacher. I'm saying this as someone who has run a language learning platform with hundreds of teachers. Trust me, there's a big difference. So, uh, yeah, of course, you decide what you want to pay for classes, but don't discount, don't discount a teacher because you think it might be too expensive. Price... Price is uh, often you get what you pay for, and I think that's 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 true for for most teachers as well. Just my two cents, just my opinion. So check this one out. Check out also iTalky. If there are others that you would like me to check out, let me know. I'm happy to I'm happy to do that too. This is not a review of the teachers. This is not a full review of the platform. I'm just uh, I'm just an explorer. So. If you do get a class on Preply, let me know what you think. I'd be very curious to hear your feedback, to hear about your experiences. I like to learn about students' experiences of these language learning platforms that are out there. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button. That really helps out the channel. Subscribe if you want to see future videos. And check out my full courses in the links in the description. All right, so that's Preply. Quit and couldn't find another teacher, so I had to fill in. Teaching is the best job ever. I used to be a teacher. I even taught English for a couple months because the English teachers I was working quit. Okay, well, cool. Yeah, I agree. Teaching is fun. I used to do. I used to work in China as a teacher. Yeah, I'm not saying that always the a price is lower means the teacher is not as good. Absolutely, absolutely. But in many cases, when it comes to that sort of thing, you get what you pay for, in my opinion. Amar says, they really do look like each other. Oh, we're talking about the Margot Robbie and Taylor Swift. Yeah, I, yeah. Although just on the magazine cover, not in real life, right? The problem here is the dollar. We pay 5.6 for $1 and it ends up being very expensive. Yeah, that's true. I think it would, I mean, it would calculate for your currency probably and your time zone. You think price doesn't mean too much? I don't know. Maybe in my experience, it can be a factor because the good teachers with a lot of great reviews are able to charge more and that's because they're good 
so they got a lot of great reviews. So it's not it's not not a factor in my opinion. One to one lessons are cr pretty good, but you need to choose. A uh, very good teacher, and that's not so easy. Exactly, I agree with with Jamie a hundred percent. That is a hundred percent right. I think this is a key thing to remember. Yeah, one to one lessons. Jamie says one to one lessons are pretty good, but you need to choose a very good teacher, and that's not so easy. But it's worth looking if you're seriously thinking about improving your English, and you want to include a teacher in your language learning journey. Spend the time to find a really good one. And how do you know what a good teacher is? A good teacher should, of course, know the language well, know how to explain things well, but they should be very specific with everything that they teach you so that it's very custom for you. That's the whole point of one-to-one, -one, right? So if you have a trial lesson. You're trying out a teacher. You get a trial lesson. Maybe it's free. Maybe you pay a few dollars. You pay a little bit for it. And you find that the teacher is saying generic things that they could say to anyone. And maybe they can explain the language okay, but their comments are not immediately clicking for you. Maybe it's time to run away and find another one. Keep looking. If you feel after a class, wow, I feel like I learned three different things, four different things about myself that I had no idea about, that I was not aware of, that because I had this lesson, now I can start working on. If you feel that way, then maybe you need to keep going, keep pursuing lessons with that teacher because that can be very powerful. It's pretty well proven that a coach who is a good coach who understands you and your unique abilities and where you need to go next can get you on the path much faster, can move you ahead much faster than if you're doing it by yourself and not aware of those things you need to be working on. So my test would be, are you giving me very specific feedback that I can understand that is actionable, meaning after this class I can start working on it, I know how to work on it, and that now that I know this helps me get where I want to go, or at least closer, one step closer to where I want to go. But if it's not very specific, if it's not actionable, actionable means you can really do something with it, I don't think that's the sign of a, of a good teacher. Of course, this is just my opinion. You don't have to listen to me. I'm just giving my uh, my general my general thoughts specific actionable very very important okay guys if you haven't by the way don't forget to hit the like button don't forget to subscribe I would appreciate that and also check out my full courses in the links in the description all right yeah Jamie that's a that's a very valid point Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, good teachers are worth every cent. I agree. I would rather pay $100 for a teacher who's going to get me five steps closer to my goal than pay $5 for a teacher who's going to comp waste an hour of my time. Just me. Although $100 is too much. <laughs> That's too expensive. $100, no. No, I don't think any teacher would charge $100 per lesson. Although there are some teachers working in China who will charge uh, almost $100 for certain types of lessons. Yeah. I think uh, uh, my friend Francis, he's, he's been on the, on the channel before. I don't want to say exactly what his prices are. They're not $100, but a lot more expensive than what we just saw. But he's that good. He's very good. He's very, very good. Mary says, I think if you find a good language partner, it will fill in the gaps. Yes, I think that's pretty valid, too. You can definitely get 
a long way with a good language partner. All right, shall we call it a day? Any other questions I missed? Oh, getting carried away. Okay. We'll do this one. And then we'll call it a day, I think. How about that? Mary McCain says, getting carried away. Could you please make sentences with, about, with, with this term? Sure. This can be used in a lot of different ways. Usually, it means... In general, it means you're going too far with something, farther than what I'm comfortable with, farther than, than what other people want to hear, perhaps, and maybe as a result, you're causing an awkward situation. You're doing something so excessively that it's causing harm. You are causing problems in general. <laughs> so it can be used very innocently, and it can be used not so innocently. I'll give you an example. Maybe someone asks me a question and I start answering the question and then I start focusing on I start focusing on something I'm very passionate about that's kind of related to the answer but I keep going with that for 10 minutes. So earlier someone asked me about articles and I gave the example of a screwdriver. So I'm using the screwdriver to explain how uh and the works. But then somewhere during my explanation, in the middle of my explanation, I start saying, now, I remember when I was a kid, I had a set of screwdrivers and blah, I start blah, 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 talking about screwdrivers for 25 minutes. What will people say? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Luke, I think you're getting a little bit carried away. You're supposed to be talking about articles. Why are you talking for 25 minutes about screwdrivers? What's wrong with you? You're getting carried away. And then afterward, to apologize, I'll say, oh, sorry, everyone, I got carried away. To make it softer, I'll say, I got a little bit carried away. Now, that would just be a slightly awkward situation, something awkward. You went too far with it. That's the thing. Usually, you get, you get caught up in a topic, an idea, you're talking about something and you get kind of lost in that and you go away from the track of what you are supposed to be talking about, supposed to be saying. Now, it doesn't have to be about talking. It could be something like this. You're getting a little bit carried away with your card magic. So someone's really interested in learning card magic. Card magic. Someone likes to learn card magic, and as a result, they have card magic, or they're doing card tricks at the dinner table. They're shuffling cards in bed at night. They're, ah, let me let me show you a trick. They're obsessed with it. Way too much. Okay, I know you're interested in magic. I'm very happy for you. I think it's wonderful. I think it's fantastic. Dennis. But in bed at dinner... During a movie? While you're out on a run? <laughs> Dennis, you are getting carried away with the card magic. I know it's your hobby. I know you love it. I know you're passionate about it. But Dennis, come on. Don't get carried away. It's starting to affect other areas of your life. It's starting to make people think a little bit oddly of you. They, they think you're being a little, not only awkward, but... Uh, a little bit of a crazy person. So that would be slightly more serious. And you could keep going. You could talk about getting carried away with drugs, I suppose. Now, it's more common for that ordinary sort of thing. But yeah, you could talk about people getting carried away with really dangerous bad habits as well. He really got carried away and it caused some serious problems. Okay, But usually it is about the things like, like this, like getting sucked into a habit or especially conversational things, going off track, talking about something that's not really relevant. So I hope that answers your question. Mary McCain, I hope I'm not getting too carried away. If so, I'm sorry I got carried away. 
Guys, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. That really helps out the channel. If you only do one thing, hit the like button. But if you want to do two things, then hit the like button and subscribe so that you can see future videos. And if you want to do three things, hit the like button, then subscribe, then click, 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 click on the link in the description and check out my full courses, which are on sale. All right. Jamie, what do you think about this? Jamie says, I know more English than other another person, so for me it could be a good practice to help this person, so I check it. I really understand by trying to explain to this person who knows less than, less than me. Yeah, I mean, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, that can certainly work. That can certainly work. Einstein said, you don't really understand something until you know how to explain it. That's what Einstein said. I think Richard Feynman said something quite similar. You don't really understand something until you know how to explain it simply to someone else. All right, guys, we're going to call it a day. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for joining. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, check out the courses. If you have questions that are in your mind that you didn't ask, then uh, we'll be doing another one of these soon. I don't want to promise tomorrow, although I would like to do one of these tomorrow. I also want to do at some point an event, like a meetup or something, like a group discussion, but I uh, haven't figured out exactly how to make that happen. So if anyone is interested in getting that going, let me know. Let's see what else. Uh, new video coming out tomorrow, so make sure to check the channel. Make sure you're subscribed so that you see, and hit the bell thing as well, so that you can see when that new video comes out, coming out tomorrow. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Much appreciated. And I will see you in the next one.